99 bad decisions cause the characters in the movie Capsize, Blood in the Water, to suffer unnecessarily. In this video, we will check out their journey and look at every single mistake they make while figuring out better alternatives. Let's go. The movie begins with Brad arriving at a pier to work a gig on John's boat. They set sail to Florida and will be at sea for multiple days. After John jokingly makes sure that Brad knows his stuff, instead of making that sure before he arrived at the pier, it is clear that he had never sailed a boat before, but as he puts it, he grew up on the water. Easy. It's not that sailing is that hard, right? Well, on the boat, there are three more characters. Mark, who had been sailing with John before, Kate, who is John's girlfriend, and Deborah, who also seems to be familiar sailing along the other characters. As the crew sets sail, we get some nice aerial shots of the sea and their boat named the Trash Man. We then cut to lunch where the five members enjoy some food. It is only then when Mark requests John to make a stopover halfway through to pick up a girl that he is apparently into. That is a bold request to make after setting sail, right? Especially after food rations have been calculated based on five passengers and not six, not to mention the extra fuel needed for a detour. Therefore, John dismisses the request and denies it. For some reason, this doesn't sit well with Mark, who now lashes out at Brett, the new guy. I guess Mark is a great team member. Now John tells Brett to fight back, as it won't end if he doesn't speak up, neglecting the fact that he is the captain and thus responsible for the crew. But it doesn't really matter, because things are about to take a 180. Literally. We cut to the Coast Guard office, who is now registering a storm front coming in from the west. Seems like they did not expect these weather conditions and are promptly calling out an alarm in case the storm gets more serious. Meanwhile, the night has arrived for our crew. The wind has been picking up lately and they too are now expecting to get into rough conditions. John goes to the lower deck to navigate their course when he finds Mark half passed out, lying on a bed. We see multiple empty beer bottles around him as well as a guy who can't phrase words correctly anymore. As John tries to alert him by mentioning the incoming storm, it is clear that Mark is too unreliable in his state that John orders him to stay on radio duty in case the worst case hits. Now the situation turns very serious very fast. Everybody's trying to secure what is to secure and support each other. Except for Mark, of course. This guy, arguably occupying one of the most important jobs right now, is napping again, all the while receiving an emergency signal from the Coast Guard passing through very important storm details, such as wind speeds, wind direction and approximate storm routes. The fact that John has seen Mark emptying around 6 bottles of beer should have been a red flag that he should have noticed. He should have sent somebody else down to take care of the radio. I mean, 6 bottles are a lot, right? Certainly enough to cause inefficiency at work. But under these circumstances, it's not the inefficiency that is a threat, but the absence of a clear mind that could easily lead to somebody's death. Now the storm gets stronger by the second, causing massive waves to shake the boat. Kate tries to fixate the items inside the kitchen, trying to prevent them from falling all over the place. But this is arguably a bad timing to do something like that. These items will likely keep falling out of place for the duration of the storm anyway. While collecting the items, a giant wave hits the boat, causing the oven to attack Kate, injuring her upper leg. Apparently, the wound runs deep as she screams as if her leg was blown off. The scream is even heard on the upper deck, causing the crew members to come down to check. John uses the radio to connect with the Coast Guard, letting them know about the serious injury one of his members suffered and requests immediate help. He is told that they will notify cargo ships in the region to check on the trash man and that they should hold their position as best as they possibly can. The ships should arrive in about 3 hours and will be able to rescue them if necessary. And John replies that this isn't fast enough and that they need an immediate route back to the shore as one of his crew members is in need for a hospital visit ASAP. The Coast Guard replies that this is not advised due to the storm coming in from the west and thus the shore. After the call, John goes back to the upper deck and briefly ponders about the best move. He decides against the Coast Guard's advice and orders Deborah to make head for the mainland. She protests, but John is the captain and what the captain says is executed. She is sent back under deck while John takes the steering wheel himself, making head for the shore. However, it doesn't take more than a few moments until a massive wave hits the boat from the side, causing it to capsize and all of our characters land in the water. At first, it's pure chaos, but despite the insane conditions, all characters miraculously find each other among the giant waves crashing around them. 
They also conveniently spot the emergency raft not too far in the distance and make their way over. Obviously, they were more than just lucky here. The tiny entry point that leads from the lower deck to the upper deck is difficult to go through even without the boat being upside down and without it being rapidly filled with water. And don't get me started on four individuals down there trying to get out at the same time. Apart from that, there were still other things they could have done so far. Let's have a look. Firstly, sailing into a superstorm is ill-advised and generally easily avoided with modern technologies. But not always. Our crew may just have had bad luck. But for Mark to get too drunk to stand wasn't bad luck, it was simply a bad decision. John as the captain should have made sure that his crew members are not downing two liters of beer in one afternoon while others are actually working. While talking to John, Mark even cracked open yet another bottle while he was clearly drunk already. This would have been the right timing to fulfill your duty as the captain and shut this bastard down. Secondly, it is not clear why Kate tried to set things in order in the kitchen during a massive storm that was bound to throw things around again anyway. Besides, a storm does not just appear within a split second, right? Sure, the weather at sea is especially volatile, but there is usually still a few moments in between some calm and absolute mayhem to put preventive measures into place. That the oven attacked her though, well, that could not have been predicted, right? But the fuss they made about it was insane. It felt like she was about to die. And with Brad babysitting her full time with only two other crew members trying to take care of things, probably a bad decision, right? It was a cut in the quads, maybe deep, maybe with lasting damage, but certainly not as important as a boat that will sustain major damage if left unmanaged, leading to the highly probable death of five people instead. She should have been attended and then left alone, because, duh, she is an adult. Mark's drinking should have been shut down the moment it got out of hand, and John should have certainly listened to the Coast Guard. But anyway, our characters are overboard now and are holding on to dear life while clinging onto the raft. Six hours adrift. The characters have been drifting for six hours now, yet they're still in the water and not on the raft. The reasoning for that is that the air temperature is cooler than the water temperature and therefore will cause hypothermia more rapidly. It is hard to identify if that's correct or not. For that, we would need to know the exact wind speeds, air temperature and water temperature to assess whether their assessment is accurate. However, generally, water convects heat 25 times faster than air, so staying in water is most often much worse. This is also the same reason why people get so hungry after spending just a little time inside the ocean or the swimming pool you simply burn way more calories for just being in the water than not. Meanwhile, Kate's wound is still bleeding, as we can see here, obviously foreshadowing what's to come. Now, John tries to calm down the crew by saying that the Coast Guard knew their previous location and should come for rescue in just a few hours. Let's see if he's right. Then, out of nowhere, Mark claims that Deborah is kicking him and that she should stop. He starts whining like a child, accusing her of kicking him for no apparent reason. It is a bizarre scene that makes you dislike this character even more, because I don't think anybody who just experienced shipwreck and now drifts around in the open Atlantic starts kicking crew members just for the fun of it, right? That is also the same time when other members start claiming that they're feeling touch sensation around their legs. Kate dives down and tries to make anything out, not that that's possible without goggles, but she sees three fully grown tiger sharks in a distance. She alerts her team and triggers panic. Everyone, especially Mark of course, starts to rush up the boat, causing it to capsize as well. Eventually, only Mark makes it on top as he urges everyone else to follow suit. This scene is horrendously long, and considering there is a group of presumably hungry tiger sharks beneath them, it just makes you shake your head. After what feels like an hour, Mark is pulled back into the water and they turn the boat back around. As everyone climbs up and is safe for now, a few moments pass and the sharks start hitting the boat ferociously from all sides. This causes further panicking and thus destabilizes the group dynamic even further. The crew freaks out, they scream in fear despite noting that they should stay quiet and calm as the sharks likely hear them underwater. I am not sure if that is the case or if that's even possible, but if that is their assessment then they should be quiet, right? Uh, John comes up with a brilliant idea to kick the shark with his foot. Yeah, uh, I think that is not a thing you want to try. Uh, firstly, it's difficult to see anything and secondly, well, there are sharks down there. It seems to work at first though, until another hit lands the boat, putting John overboard straight into the water. It seems like it's lunchtime, but for some reason the attacking sharks take a break and allow the other crew members to help their captain back into the boat again. 
We then cut to the Coast Guard who is assembling a rescue team to look for seven ships that seem to be off radar, including the Trash Man. They pinpoint their approximate location and send out helicopters to search for them. Meanwhile, the crew has been adrift for 14 hours straight, yet no rescue is in sight. Either the Coast Guard has just taken action now, or our characters are way off in waters that nobody thought was possible for them to end up in. Either way, with the glaring sun, no protection from above, and certainly no water or food rations on board, the death trap is set, even without the sharks beneath. John thinks they have been drifting westwards for the time being, meaning towards the coast. If his calculations are right, they should arrive at the coast in about 20 hours, should the currents remain stable. Now, there have been many people adrift in the history of mankind, many of which were adrift for weeks and sometimes even for months exceeding a year. Many have survived, that our characters are so close to the coast in the 21st century, with many vessels going back and forth, especially off the coast of the USA, it would be hard to stay unnoticed. However, without the means to actively steer the boat, they are at the mercy of the currents which is less than ideal. But the inability to steer their boat is not their only problem. Kate, with her deep wound, is on the brink of collapse as the injury is badly inflamed. John decides to tie up the wound to slow down the spread of the inflammation. I've never heard of a technique like that, since inflammation is a natural body response, but maybe it's a legit technique, I don't know. If anybody knows anything, drop a comment with your knowledge. Now Mark protests, saying that she will scream and thrash, attracting another round of shark attacks. But John ignores his concerns and proceeds. Tying up the belt around her leg, she soon starts to scream and kick, just as Mark had said. A short while later, the sharks are at it again. Mark uses his chance and grabs the belt from John and throws it into the open water. Probably shouldn't throw away possible tools when lost at sea, but okay. This makes John attack Mark now, causing an even more volatile group. As the next night creeps in, we see John babbling to himself, displaying the onset of a breaking psyche. It is a bit quick for someone who spends most of his days at sea, but the story needs a progression, so I guess here we go. The next day, when he wakes up, he sees an island and jumps into the water screaming that they are saved. The others soon notice his absence and call out to him, telling him to return. However, he only replies that there is an island and that they are safe, at least until he turns around and sees nothing. At this point, however, it's already too late. He tries to make his way back to the raft, and as he almost arrives, he is attacked by sharks and shred to pieces while the others have a front row seat to the spectacle. Unfortunate ending for John, but for someone who spends most of his days in the open sea, being adrift for less than two days is pretty fast to lose your mind and hallucinate a full-blown island, right? Besides, jumping into the water to swim to the island would not have been a good idea either way. I guess the boat has just gotten a bit more cozy for our other characters, although I'm sure most of us would have wished for Mark to bite the dust. We cut to a little later. The characters have been adrift for two days and three hours now. Without access to fresh water, this is extremely long. All of them are likely experiencing intense thirst, rapid heartbeats, and blasting headaches. For some odd reason, Mark, who has been the most paranoid person on this boat, decides to cool himself down by putting his arms into the sea. This certainly cools you down, but what about the sharks? It's like you're offering them both of your arms at the same time. Why not soak your t-shirt in the water and then wring it out on your body? Seems to be more rational than this right here. This dude washes himself like he's in a Japanese bath. The others soon follow suit for some reason, all with the steadiness of a monk who had been meditating for months. It's like they forgot they have been attacked a dozen times by sharks since drifting around. But what's even more insane is the fact that Mark soon opts for drinking the salt water. I get stomach cramps just thinking about it. This is the worst thing you can do in this situation. This will lead to a much more intense thirst as well as dry you out even more. Besides, it tastes agonizingly terrible. His crew members try to pull him away from being stupid, but Mark is being Mark again. They warn him, saying that drinking seawater will make him go crazy, but his thirst is too intense to be rational. The following night, when the crew members try to get some shut eye, Mark starts screaming as if he too were now attacked by the oven. It's really the last thing you would want to hear being lost at sea, a grown man losing his mind, not to speak of the dangers coming from that. The others try to calm him down, but to no avail. The next morning, we see that they have been adrift for 81 hours straight, that is over three and a half days. And if nobody has found you by now, it'll be difficult to stay positive. 
At the very least, Mark, after going through another round of absolute mental nonsense, drops into the water and is shredded to pieces by the sharks. Now before heading into the final act, let's see if there was anything at all they could have done instead to survive just a little bit better. Let's speak of the Tongan castaways for a second. These three teenage boys were stranded in the open Pacific for 50 days. They had a limited food supply on board, unlike our characters, however the boys only intended to go on a short fishing trip. No food rations of theirs would have lasted for 50 days straight. They survived by collecting rainwater and catching birds and fish. At the very beginning, the characters in our film went overboard due to a storm. They should have planned ahead and made sure to collect some of the pouring rain that was coming down. They had a raft available that could have acted as a container, but when they got scared of the sharks, they capsized it due to sheer stupidity. They also had access of the perimeter line of the raft, yet they never bothered to use it. As people basically live in on the open sea, or at least spending a significant portion of their years on the open sea, they should have at least attempted to catch some fish, right? Maybe the chances for that were slim, but at the end of the day, you can't catch fish without trying to catch fish. They also ignored the fact that they could have easily escaped the burning sun by stretching their clothing across the boat, by fixating it uh, on the perimeter line. Would have been pretty useful to escape the harmful UV rays as well as escaping the heat, especially when soaking the clothing in water first. All in all, these characters have only made bad decisions so far. Nothing they have done from start to now made any sense. Any half-sane person in such place would come up with at least some idea to make the situation better. Now, in the present moment, however, the next night already creeped in and Kate too is now on the brink of death. Brad speaks a few hopeful words to her, but when the next day arrives, it is clear that she has already left the world. They drop her body into the sea and are now on their own which was a good idea because decomposing bodies aren't fun to have on board, right? But at least they should have stripped her of her clothing in order to use them as tools when necessary. You see, literally everything becomes valuable when there is nothing. Now, if all previous bad decisions weren't enough, our two remaining characters try their utmost best to top their predecessors by making two more highly questionable decisions. During Mark's mental period, uh, the raft had filled with water. It's not a lot, but it's a little dirty, you know? They decide it would be best to get rid of it, which is not a bad idea, but the way they go about this makes you scratch your head. Instead of taking their time, because that's all they have, and use their hands to shovel out the excess water or soak it up with their clothes and wring it out overboard, they decide it would be better to jump into the shark-infested water, where three of their friends have been eaten by sharks, turn the boat around, empty the thing, and turn it around again. Now, of course, they make it back into the raft safely, but I think we can all agree that this wasn't the brightest idea. Why would you risk your life for that? Now, we then cut to the final timestamp of 131 hours. That is tough, not gonna lie, that's a very long time, but we have already established that they didn't do anything to help that situation. Then, after what feels like an hour, Brad is woken up by a massive cargo ship edging closer from the distance. Now guess what our characters do? That's right, they jump into the water and swim towards it. That makes no sense, no matter how you look at it. You see the chance that your tiny floating head is spotted among the waves around you from the deck of this thing is zero. Also, after having been adrift for almost a week without food or water, they would not have the energy to swim over to that thing. No chance they wouldn't drown before that. Oh. Oh, wait, wait, uh, well, that's actually what happens, kind of. As Red arrives at a giant vessel, he looks back and sees Deborah underwater. Now, he dives down, uses his super underwater vision to find her, catches her just a second before the tiger shark gets to her, has him turn around, and then successfully rescues his last crew member as they get pulled on board this giant Russian cargo ship. I guess, happy ending, right? Uh, the story progression in this film stopped the minute the crew was on the raft, right? They didn't do anything other than just floating around for the last 70 minutes of this film. Not that exciting to be honest, but certainly valuable to find out what not to do when ending up in their position. By the way, this movie was also based on a true story, however the true story went a little bit different. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed this week's video my friends, I'll catch you again next week, uh, Sunday as always, and you take care, binge another one.